the Agile brand. Welcome to the Delighted Customers Podcast, now part of the Agile Brand Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mark Slayton, and I am so glad you're here. I empower leaders to delight their customers, and I talk to guests with a wide range of expertise who share meaningful insights, wisdom, and practical tips that you can use immediately. I'm also excited to announce the Trusted Guide Roadmap Masterclass for CX leaders who struggle with executive buy-in and are ready to go beyond CX fundamentals. The Masterclass gives you proven frameworks, and takes you step-by-step through a four-step model that will move you past the frustration of not getting your work done. It's unique because it's live, interpersonal, hands-on, and we give you tools and templates to help you build your CX roadmap. To learn more, visit empoweredcx.com. That's E-M-P-O-W-E-R-E-D-C-X.com. And now, on to the show. Welcome, and I am excited to share this episode that aired in 2023 with one of the most influential people globally when it comes to customer experience, and that is Joe Pine. In this episode, Joe talks about creating value for customers by providing time well spent and time well invested. The author of The Experience Economy, Joe is truly one of the pioneers of CX and on my Mount Rushmore of CX legends. I think you learn as much as I did, if not more, from one of the CX masters. Let's dive right in. Well, I am so excited to have on my show today, Joe Pine, a CX thought leader, a speaker, an author, and in my opinion, a luminary in our field. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate those uh, those comments. <laughs> no, really, I mean it, and we're going to talk more about why I'm, I'm saying that. But first, if you don't mind, just uh, introduce your, yourself to the audience. Let them know kind of uh, what led you up to doing what you're doing today. Well, um, so I, you know, I always say I'm an author, speaker, and management advisor, uh, helping companies basically create greater economic value in their business. And I've been doing this for 30 years. In fact, I did a LinkedIn post, um, what was it, 10, 12 days, 13 days ago, uh, where I said that I had left IBM 30 years ago, All right? So that's what started me on this journey. I was, I was very much a nerd to start out with and worked in IBM and very technical jobs, moved up to management and strategy. And I uh, discovered the concept of mass customization, which is uh, uh, Stan Davis, the late Stan Davis, uh, uh, wrote a book called Future Perfect in 1987. And when I read it, it was like the heavens opened up and the angels sang because it explained what I was seeing going on at IBM, that we, we were designing computers for this general purpose market that didn't exist. And so I worked on getting mass customization into our plans and strategies. Uh, and, uh, and then IBM sort of reward uh, for various work I'd done, sent me to MIT for a year to get my master's degree. And I had an opportunity uh, five weeks ago to go back, spent four days at MIT with a client doing a few speeches and then uh, touring around, meeting professors and so forth. So it was just you know, such an intellectually stimulated environment. It was just yeah. great to be there. Yeah. Uh, and then when I found out I had to do a thesis, I said, I'm going to do a thesis I can turn into a book. Right? So mass customization was my thesis at MIT. And then when I got back to IBM, I got a book contract to be able to write it. It came out in late 1992. And, um, and then in June of the following year, 30 years ago, I, I, I uh, left IBM uh, and started to, to go out on my own. And so I've been talking about that. And it was shortly after that, that I discovered the experience economy. So it was like, uh, so I, IBM was my biggest client. I came back and taught their consultants and the clients at the IBM Advanced Business Institute out in New York. And uh, I was doing a, a, a workshop with a, an all day workshop with the consulting group. And I said something I often do, which is that mass customizing a good, right? A physical good automatically turns it into a service. Hmm. Look at the classic distinction. Goods are standardized, but services are customized. They're done for an individual person. Goods are inventoried after production, but services are delivered on demand when the customer says this is what they want. And goods are tangible and services intangible, but part and parcel of mass customization is the intangible service of helping people figure out what it is that they want. 
you know, so, uh, you know, sort of a classic example now I use all the time is the, uh, have you seen the Coca-Cola freestyle machines and like five guys and Wendy's and oh, where you can pick whatever flavor. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, I mean, that's mass customization. You pick whatever flavor you want. You define what it is that you want with the touch screen, you know, a little design tool that they have. You can mix all the different types of Cokes. You can add lemon and lime and cherry and so forth. And you, you define what you want. And then, and only then, does it get put in finished in inventory, right? You put your cup in there, you press the button, and then you get the Coke that you define, right? So that really, they're really in the service business of helping you figure out what you want with the touchscreen and then delivering only and exactly what you want, right? So that's what mass customization is. So this, uh, this uh, consultant in the back of the room, sort of a smart aleck, said, well, you talked about service companies that mass customize. What does it turn a service into? And I shot back mass customization automatically turns a service into an experience. And I went, whoa, that sounds good. Hold on a sec. Whoa. <laughs> Break that down, right? <laughs> so literally, it was Providence. It just came out of my mouth, right? Never thought about it before, but I thought about it a lot afterwards. And I realized that that, that was true, number one, that, that if, you, if you design a service that is so appropriate for a particular person, exactly the service that they need at this moment in time, customized to them, then you can't help but make them go, wow, and turn it into a memorable event, right? And that's what an experience is. It's a memorable event that engages each person in an inherently personal way. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, I realized that experiences, therefore, were a distinct economic offering, as distinct as, as from services, as services were from goods and goods were from commodities. Excuse me again. And there, therefore, there would be an economy based off of experiences, just like there is the agrarian economy based off commodities, industrial economy based off goods, service economy. And, and so that was the, the beginning of, of the experience economy. Uh, was that, you know, that just flash that, that came out and then starting to think richly about it and, and what it meant. And that led to Several articles begin in 1996, including a Harvard Business Review article in 98 that got a lot of attention called Welcome to the Experience Economy. And then in 99, we published the first edition of the Experience Economy with the subtitle Work is Theater in Every Business is Stage. Okay. And then since then, so bring us bring us forward to today. Um, since then, you've been, you've written other books, you co collaborated with other books, and then, yeah, bring us up to speed. Yeah, so yeah, so I wrote that book with my partner uh, Jim Gilmore, uh, who who became my right after IBM. Then he became my biggest client when he worked for CSC Consulting, and uh, and we did research together. And and so we decided to to uh, he left and, and joined me, and we took uh, another partner from CSC called uh, Doug Parker, uh, who who was our managing partner and does everything else. So so we came out with the book. We we then started you know doing a you know ton of speaking workshops again, consulting with companies on it. Um, one of the things we recognized was that, um, particularly on trips to the Netherlands, right? I've been to the Netherlands you know probably three dozen times. I was a visiting professor at the University of Amsterdam for a while, and whenever I would talk about experiences, they would always ask a particular question at the end, and it was actually less a question than an accusation. And I'll always began with the same two words, you Americans. <laughs> the Dutch would say, you Americans, right? You like your Disneyland, your fantasy, you know, your, your, your uh, uh, um, you know, in your face sort of experiences. But we Dutch, we like our natural, authentic experiences. And, and this happened so often, I got to thinking about it and sort of developed a practice response. Um, which involved telling them that they're wrong. <laughs> the day, the, you know, basically I say, you know, it's it's interesting getting this question because you come from a country that's ever bit as as uh, fantasy as as uh, Disneyland is, right? That 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 the, it's not a natural place, right? You you two thirds of the country you recovered from the sea, uh, you and 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 every every uh, you you go for a walk in the woods. And it's the only place where I've ever been. Um, uh, walking in the woods and all the trees are lined up in rows, right? Because they plant their forests, <laughs> right? It's not, you know, and they, they, they'd always go, mm, and then they realize I'm right, right? But what it said is that, that there really is this desire for authenticity. Sort of like everybody around the world wants to think that the experiences they have are authentic, even if they're different than everybody else's. And so what Jim and I realized is that authenticity is really becoming the new consumer sensibility, we call it, that, that, um, 
the primary buying criterion by which people choose who to buy from and what to buy. And it just naturally arose with the rise in the experience economy because of, um, of uh, uh, the uh, of the fact that, that as life becomes more and more of a paid for experience, we just question what is real and what is not. And increasingly, people don't want the fake from the phony, they want the real from the genuine. So in 2007, and just on LinkedIn today, uh, somebody posted a book review of it, you know, even though it's uh, from 2007, uh, yeah. we came out with authenticity, what consumers really want. And so if your mm -hmm. listeners are interested in that, they should look up that book. We updated the uh, experience economy in 2011. It was the first time it came out in paperback because for those 12 years, it kept selling. You know, the, 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 one of the secrets of the book industry is when a book comes out in paperback because nobody buys it in hardcover anymore. And so okay. they lower the cost and hope more people buy. So we didn't come out with it until 2011 when we decided to update it. And, and in, the, in the first edition, we said, we talked about the emerging, the forthcoming, the nascent experience economy. Here we said, uh, in 2011, we said it's here, right? We're now in the experience economy. You can see that it's happening. In 1999, and, and for years after, it, I had to argue with people that it was happening. By 2011, I just say it and everybody gets it, right? Because it's in the air that we breathe, right? We see it all around us, particularly after the pandemic, where we realized that, you know, as, as we don't need more stuff, even if it's the ordered online and delivered contactlessly, uh, what we missed during the pandemic was the shared experiences that we have uh, with our family, with our loved ones, with our friends, our colleagues, and even with complete strangers. So you can see that basic shift going on. Um, yeah. 2011, I also wrote a book called Infinite Possibility, uh, Creating Customer Value on the Digital Frontier to talk about how you fuse the real and the virtual at the beginning of augmented reality, virtual reality, and all that. So I talk about that in there. And then 2020, we re-released the experience economy, uh, released it for the third time. Uh, with a new preview on on uh, competing for customer time, attention, and money. Because time, attention, money are the currencies of the experience economy. That's what you're battling for. And 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 therefore, you need to, to, to get into the experience business or your goods and services are going to be commoditized, uh, which puts you where you're competing against the world for the time, attention, money of individual customers. So we talk in there how to go about it, in particular about how... Um, you uh, create experiences, create and stage experiences that are robust, cohesive, personal, dramatic, and even transformative, right? That those are the five key elements of experiences. So there's been a lot of other stuff in there too that I've written and, and thought about all this sort of, I, I, I liken it to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? I got this universe of thought that I keep expanding out in, in different directions, but, uh, but those are the highlights, Mark, probably more than yeah. one. No, no, I, I, I love it. And I want to double tap on a whole bunch of it because there's a lot to unpack on what you just shared. But um, before we do, I, I am a fan of strength, uh, many others, but a fan of strengths finders, G Gallup, Clifton. Yep. And, and one of mine is ideation. And I'm guessing you may also share that in your top five strengths is ideation. Have you ever taken yeah, this? Yeah, break? I I love idea. I love idea beyond, uh, you know, on behalf of clients in particular and thinking of new ideas. What I say is my, my fundamental strength, which actually goes back to my applied mathematics degree, where I had a class on model making. But the, the primary thing that I do is, is one, that's pattern recognition, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing what's going on in the world and seeing the patterns, connecting dots and say, okay, this is significant. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I like to say that I can, I can develop a trend off of a data point of one, <laughs> Because right? even one one company do something, and say, oh, you know, that's something. I can see how other companies could do that. And then two, the model making is developing frameworks that first describe what's happening and then prescribe what companies can do about it. Right, and that's what I did first with mass customization, um, uh, which is now you know like this huge thing that that companies are doing the world over. Uh, secondly, with the experience economy, and then on and on with the other uh, other concepts. Right, figure out what's going on, develop a model explain to, to companies, this is what's going on and this is what you can do about it. Yeah. And, um, and so if you were paying attention as, as you delineated your work history and your, your book history, um, if you notice the, the years that he was talking about, Joe is ahead of his time um, and, and a futurist in that sense, another one of the strengths. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when I go back and I think about, customer experience management, you know, I'm the board right now, I'm serving on the board of directors of CXPA, the Customer Experience Professionals Association. 
Well, what you were talking about was way ahead of that. CXPA didn't start till 2011, 2012. Right. And so I've had, I've been, I remember, I remember the first, first annual conference you had, I think yeah. it was Bruce Tempkin, if I remember, but, but I donated, it was right after the, the update edition came out. So I donated like 20 books for them to give out for, for various things at the, at the conference. I think Bruce was the one that requested it, but I'm not positive. Yeah. Well, and, and so what I was going to say, speaking of Bruce, um, I, I've had, I've had some people who go back you know, to that time and before on my show, I've been fortunate enough um, to have people like Bruce, Bruce Temkin, Rob Markey, Lou Carbone on the show. And they, they always refer back to the experience economy and Joe Pine. Um, so what I, what I'm cu curious about is, and I may have asked you this last time we spoke was, you know, where did this word customer experience or employee experience or experience management, like, were you when you just shared that story about service yeah. into an experience, you know, was that really and you then you built on that over the next few years? Was that really the first that we came to know customer experience management? Yeah, I think so. The the I mean, the and and then when I started publishing about it, um, uh, it you know, I, I always felt like the customer experience movement came out of that focus on yeah. experiences. And when we came out with the book, it really did that. I would also cite uh, Lou Carbone's book, Clued In, um, yeah. which I think was was one of the first to really look at how do you how do you turn things into experiences, right? How do you make experiences out? He, di he didn't you know talk about experiences as a distinct economic offering, but sort of everything but. So I think that was the other key thing, and then other other books then then followed off of there. So I, I, you know, Lou deserves a lot of credit as well. Yeah, no question about it. So going back to the experience economy, um, in the book, and you say I love this um, work is theater, and every business is a stage. Um, every business is a stage. Um, I love that because um, while I have absolutely no talent when it comes to theater. <laughs> I come, I, my wife and, and kids have tons of talent in that area. So I love to go watch. And I do say that without fans, there is no theater. So I'm one of the fans. Um, and, and the book says, you know, in the, in the subtitle of the book, the book demonstrates how goods and services are no longer enough. What companies must offer today are experiences. This is going back to 1999. Um, memorable events that engage each customer in an inherently personal way. It, fur it further shows that in today's experience economy, companies now compete against the world of time, attention, money of individual customers. So could you say more about that? Right. Well, uh, yeah, the, the, the very notion is like is that with the experience is what's the economic function, right? You extract commodities and trade them on the open marketplace. You make or manufacture goods, right? And then put them in inventory. You deliver services on with that individual person that's there in your factory, so to speak. So with experiences, it's staging. You stage experiences. And what does that mean? It means that you are intentional about everything, that you design every element intentionally to be able to engage people, right? And, and, right. and that, that's, that happens inside of them, right? That's where the experience actually happens is inside of us in reaction to the events that are staged in front of us. So once you start talking about staging as the key economic function, well, then it's just natural that work is theater, right? That, that you, and, and theater is being intentional about everything you do. Theater is about how you do what you do. So you may have the same functional crime. So what's may be the same, but how you go about doing that can turn any mundane interaction into an engaging counter. So I always say with companies that the first thing to think about when you want to get experiences is theater because it requires no capital equipment. It merely requires that you understand that work is theater, that you direct your workers to act, and then you, you uh, give them the wherewithal to act on your, uh, your business stage. So, so Mark, right now, whether you know it or not, you are acting, right? You have an audience out there, as you said, uh, and uh, and uh, you are being intentional about what you did. Maybe choosing what you what you wore today. I, for example, actually changed my shirt. I've got a golf match this afternoon. I was wearing a particular golf match, a, a golf uh, a shirt, but it has stripes in it, right? And I know stripes don't work well <laughs> when thin stripes yeah. don't work well on on Zoom and and uh, video. So I ch intentionally changed my shirt to give the right impression of, of being out here. 
Uh, I always remember uh, famed stage director Peter Brook uh, once wrote a wonderful book um, uh, called The Empty Stage. And a short little tome, but, uh, but he, the opening line is, he said, I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this stage while someone else is watching him, and that's all that is needed for an active theater to be engaged. Mm. Right? So to your point, it requires people watching, <laughs> right? They are, are knowing that they're going to watch in the future, such as with this, with this recording, right? You, if people are watching and you're working, you're on stage, right? Whether you know it or not, whether you do it well or not, you're acting and need to act in a way that uh, engages the audience. So um, th that is really interesting. And I think about, you know, for, for organizations and business leaders or, and or CX leaders, um, if they think about their customers and the experience that they have, what you're saying really is, I mean, it, it kind of is looking at the journey that they go through as the theatrical act and then how how you intentionally purpose the different aspects of that journey in a way that creates an experience that uh, it creates value for for their time attention and money that they're willing to trade off right right that they're willing to spend their time with you they're willing to give you their attention they're even willing to pay for the experience ideally explicitly through an admission fee or a membership fee or some other way of of charging for time right that's what you do with experiences is you charge for time uh, and, and as you said, the other aspect of theater is that journey you're talking about, and, and I, I like to phrase it as it's dramatic structure, right? Mm. It's dramatic structure, right? The intensity, the complication, what happens in the experience, you know, has to rise up to a climax and come back down again. If you have a flat experience, right, where nothing else happened, you know, the, a lot of a watchword around CX today is frictionless, right? Mm. And yeah, if, and if you want great service, frictionless is exactly the way that you want to go. But if you want an engaging experience, you want an experience that's memorable, then you need to be frictionful, <laughs> right? Mm. Frictionful is when things happen, the obstacles happen to get up to that you have to overcome in order to get up to that climax and, and, and come back down again. So you design that dramatic structure uh, that your customers go through in order to create the, the engagement and create the memory. So Joe, let, let's talk about a, a practical application. And then I want to go back to a chart that I saw you share in one of your speeches, one of your presentation, one of your keynotes um, that had sort of these four or five levels and above the line was, uh, and let me come back to that in a minute. But from, from an application standpoint, if I'm a bank, right, and I'm a banking customer, um, there are certain things that I want to have done with without a whole lot of friction Right. And dr and drama, right? right? If I go to an ATM machine to get money out, which I don't do anymore, but people still do that, um, I guess. And, or if I go to, if I, I haven't I, been to an ATM in a decade myself, but yes, I, I still I get know. cash. But instead of an ATM, I go to a Julie. I've got a Julie at home, and Julie gets cash for me when I need it. <laughs> you're, you're lucky. I I don't have a Julie. Um, <laughs> Everybody should have a Julie. You're wonderful. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, so there are certain, so how would you, what would you say? Um, cause people, uh, you know, people, we're not talking about creating obstacles and, 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 and friction that's painful. Can right. you, can you share, you know, how right. the practical application of that would look? So, right. So if you look at banking, I'll say, first of all, no industry is more commoditized itself than mm. banking. Why? Because they came to view spending time with customers as costing them money, right? So they want to push them out of the branches where they're costing us money to use ATMs. They want to push them out uh, to use a phone voice response system. They want to push them out to, to access it over the internet. They want to push them out, give them an app so they can do everything on their app. And we want that, right, when we're looking for service, right? And, and, and services are basically about time well saved, that you save my time in doing this activity, right? And they're absolutely, we want it to be frictionless. We want it to be as convenient as possible. Uh, we want to get it done and over as, as quickly as possible. But what experiences are time well spent, that people actually value the time. So are there times in banking when you're looking for that? Absolutely. I mean, the one example I'll, I'll point to, the original ING Direct Cafes, that are now the Capital One 360 Cafes, right? 
So now this is this is them saying, look it, here's an opportunity to come spend time with bankers. And we don't have to make a formal appointment. We don't have to to um, um, you know get you, uh, me behind the desk and and you out there and so forth. Or, or a teller where they're up on high and a high stool and looking down on you and that uh, instead, hmm. let's just have a conversation, right? Let's just informally talk about what you need. And they get, they get uh, people to come in and have that conversation. Right. And that's not time well saved. They're actually spending more time with the bank, right? It's time well spent over a, over a cup of coffee or um, um, what was the other one I was thinking of? Yeah, I lost that one. Um, well yeah, so you read my mind when you when I drew that line and I was about to go in that direction with my follow-up right. question, which was I saw that illustration and I love that illustration. Love I'd love you to share a little bit more about that because I think you had maybe good services later below the line. Right. And and that 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 works nicely into the question I had previously asked about, you know, how should we design experiences as as business leaders? Um, so you talk about, you know, service below the line, time well saved, sometimes that's what we're looking for, but then time well spent. So talk about when they both apply. Right. So, so they, they, they both apply like even all experiences of time well saved aspects, right? If you're going to Walt Disney world for the day, do you want to spend a half hour waiting in line at the entrance mm -hmm. to get in and pay your money? No, you want to book in advance. You want to get a magic band. You want to walk up, go ding, boom, you're in. Right. So the right. service aspects of the experiences are should be time well said, because all of this is if, if you got any uh, technology leaders. Right. This is a stack. Right. The, this progression of economic values, I call it, is a stack and that experiences are the layer of experiences are built on top of the layer of services. You can't have experiences without having uh, services and you want those service aspects to be time well uh, saved. services you can't create without goods, you know, whether they're the the the. Uh, tables and chairs at a, at a cafe or a restaurant, uh, the dry clean equipment in a, in, a, in a laundry facility or whatever they might be. You have to have goods. You build surround those goods with the service activities of using those goods on behalf of the, the customer. And goods, of course, are made out of commodities, right? So they're all of a, a, a stack like that. And so, so the, the line that I draw between services and experiences is that time well saved versus time well spent. Right, services, goods, commodities, time well saved. Experiences, time well spent. And and I, and I will make a quick aside, which is in fact though many of the goods that we buy are to enable the experiences that we have. Right, I'm playing golf this afternoon. Well, I've got golf clubs, and the golf clubs enable me to play that experience. You go surfing, you have a surfboard. So so just a vast majority of goods we buy, in fact, are for the services that they enable. Um, and uh, and so there's the, the, there's one level below that that I don't usually draw in that way, uh, and that's time wasted, right? The worst thing you can do is waste your customers' time, right? And companies do that all the time. You know, by, uh, you, you you call up a call center. This happened to me just the other day, right? I called up a call center. It asked me and it asked me to provide my account information, right? So they could identify me, even my address and that. And the voice response unit specifically said. So we can pass it on to the representative. But I get to the representative, what's the first thing they asked me for? <laughs> right? Is all that information they gave. Yeah. And I specifically said, I already told, told gave that information. They said they pass it on to you. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't have I'm like, just like wasting my time to do that over again. Or you 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 go to a doctor's appointment or hospital, the first thing they do is they give you a form to fill out of information they already have. Right. right. So you're the same thing. So yes. you've got to stop wasting customers' time, and and uh, and then you turn that into time well saved, right? Then you've got time well spent, uh, and again, that's the, the 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 province of experiences. Ideally, you are charging for the time because you are what you charge for. If you charge for undifferentiated stuff, you're in the commodities business. If you charge for tangible things, you're in the goods business. If you charge for the activities your people perform on behalf of the customer or the client, then you're in the services business. But economically, you're in the experience business if and only if you charge for time, right? Because that's what people value. And so you, I always use Starbucks as a great example because you can see the coffee progression. It starts off as a commodity worth two or three cents per cup, turn it into a good that you buy at the grocery store worth five, 10, 15 cents per cup. You go to a vending machine or a corner diner, a bodega, 7-Eleven somewhere, and now you're paying 50 cents, dollar or two per cup. 
but you you buy that cup and spend time in the ambience and theater of a Starbucks, and now you're spending four, five, six dollars per per cup of coffee. But Starbucks charges gives away the experience to better sell the coffee, right? They they charge a premium for it. But eventually, you have to align what you charge for with what your customers value, and that is the time that they spend with you. That's that time well spent aspect. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that illustration of the coffee bean, because the bean is two to three cents, right? Right. Uh, but by the time you're you're changing the way it's it, it's consumed, uh, it's an experience, and that becomes time well spent. We only have so many hours in a day to live. Exactly. So the so when you can change, you know, your your offering to time well spent, like Starbucks then you can charge for it. And you just gave the, the financial uh, business case for getting to that point. So I, I really like where we're traversing um, to, to bring it to, to reality. You wrote an article uh, about a year with collaborated on an article called The New You Business right. that was published in HBR in February of 2022. And you say companies and economies create more and more value as they shift from selling commodities to manufacturing goods, to delivering services, to staging experience, experiences. Transformations extend this progression to the fifth level where companies help customers achieve major change. Say more about that. Yeah, so, so transformations is that fifth and final economic offering. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as a stack again, it's built on top of experiences. It's why I said earlier that you want to create even transformative experiences, right? Because we only ever change through our experiences. As the saying goes, we're all the product of our experiences. And, and we can, and, and companies can intentionally design them to help us create that major change, to help us meet our, our aims, our goals, our ambitions, and particularly more, most generally talk about our aspirations. So I go to a golf uh, coach to help me turn me into a better golfer, a single digit handicap golfer, for example, I go to a fitness I've, I've tried that and it hasn't yet worked, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it did for me. And then I went back and now I'm coming down. But anyway, <laughs> you go to a fitness center in order to lose weight or, or to Weight Watchers or, or uh, uh, other companies or get the new map in order to lose weight. Uh, we all have these aspirations and, and, and um, uh, certain industries are fundamentally about transformation, not about goods and services, right? And, and, and what I like to use is Ben Franklin's famous phrase that, that businesses, they're in the business of helping people be healthy, wealthy, or wise are in the transformation business. Mm -hmm. and, and just to come back again to what you talked about earlier, wealthy means banks, means financial advisors and so forth. And, uh, and while banks, they, they, they tend to talk about their products and services, and they say it like it's one word, right? With five syllables, products and services. Yeah, so that's six syllables. And uh, um, uh, uh, and even though they don't have any products, right? There's no physical goods that they have other than brochures. There's no no nothing they sell that has a physicality to it. Uh, but yet they lump it together because I mean it's packaged. It's sort of they commoditize the services themselves by turning them into products. And instead, they need to think about going beyond products and services to experiences and transformations. That. Um, that money effectively is a means to an end. There, there are a few people for whom it is the end, but uh, uh, money is a means to an end for most people. And if you can sell the end rather than the means, then you can gain much more economic value. And, and, and transformation, we talk about time well saved, time well spent. Transformations are time well invested. Mm -hmm. right? That people are investing their time in those time well spent experiences in order to pay dividends and compound interest now and into the future, right? That's what we're looking for with transformations. Yeah, and so you talk about um, businesses partnering with consumers to improve some fundamental aspects of their lives to achieve a new you. That's the title of the article, right? Right, right. It is, it's about a new you. It's that you have particular aspirations you want to achieve. And, and one of the other things we say in there is change is incredibly hard to accomplish on our own. Right. It's difficult to change, whether it's to lose weight or quit smoking or get better at golfing or tennis or uh, boating, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, and so we we hire people, we hire companies to help us do that, uh, to help us achieve those those aspirations to become that new you. 
So it's a huge opportunity in, in healthy, wealthy, and wise industries and beyond to think about why your customers want your offering, right? That's the key. I talked about how services are the what and experiences the how, right? That's what the theater aspect to it. With transformations, you need to think about the why, right? Not why you're in business, although of course that relates, but why is your customer buying this? What what it is it that they really want? And then and then sell the sell the next let sell the end rather than the means to which your offering um, 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 it, it, to which your offerings is the means. So so sort of thinking about what's your customer's goal. What, 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 do they, what do they want to achieve what, by using or interacting with you and your products or services? Right, exactly, right. What is their goal? And, it, and it's, going to be, it's going to be as individual as every customer you have, right? We can talk about generically fitness centers take people from, from um, uh, flabby to fit. Uh, healthcare generically from uh, uh, sick to well. Financial services generically from uh, um, uh, where they are today, which may be poor or otherwise, but too wealthy, right? That's where they're wealth advisors and they want to make you wealthy. Um, um, but every individual has a particular reason, right? I may go to a financial advisor uh, because I want to retire well. I may go to a financial advisor because um, I want to be able to send the kids to college. I may go to a financial advisor because I want to have a big vacation every year and be able to, to put away money to be able to, uh, to afford that and, and so on and so forth. We'll all have our individual, often idiosyncratic reasons. So you need to find out that why. You know, the first step of a transformation I like to call is diagnosis, right? Diagnosis. Who is this customer? What do they want to become? Where are they today, right? Then when you've got that gap between their aspiration and their, their state today, then you can design the set of experiences that take them um, uh, to that uh to that level right and often there's some backsliding in there right like like you know i, I was above uh, below single on single digit now i'm above single digit got to get back again you have that uh and and so you design the set of experiences and the third thing you need is follow through and right? follow not follow up which is hi how you doing but follow through which is ensuring that the transformation takes hold right if i quit smoking go through a, a transformational quit smoking program uh, you know and then three weeks later i light up again I wasn't really transformed. You've got to ensure that it, it uh, uh, stays through time. Good. It's a really important point because whatever industry or business you're in, um, sometimes people think even the, even the experience ends when you've, you've sold the product or, or service right. and you got paid for it. And, and that's really not true. Right. Yeah. right. There's yeah. always things that you can do after that create even more value. Yeah. Um, so, so great conversation, so much good stuff. I hope if you're listening, you've got some real practical applications out of this. And, and I think I hopefully in that last discussion that we just talked about, even if you're in, you're a middleman, you're a wholesaler, um, if you're selling, forgive me, widgets, um, you, you know, somewhere in that process that aren't quite as uh, transformative as a, a Disney World or a fitness uh, expert or a wealth management person, you could still get the main point, which is you are serving someone. What are their goals, and how do you how do you build value for them and personalize the experience? Right. Right. Exactly. Is is thinking about that that next level, and I like to say B two B companies should, in particular, uh, think about the transformation level. Think about going you know up that chain. To provide more value for the customer because no company ever buys their offerings because it wants their offerings. It's always a means to an end, right? So again, you work towards those ends. Why do they want that offering? And, you know, go from just uh, uh, delivering, you know, widgets, as you say, to, mm -hmm. to someplace to, to category management and managing the entire category, right? Not you, where you don't have to have people that will put this in place. We'll do that. We'll put it on your shelves. We'll put it in your lot and so forth. You know, and then what the next level that we can do to help them become a better business, right? That's what they want. They want to become a better business. Okay. All right. Terrific. And you and I talked about an, a concept that um, that is fresh for you and something you've been stirring the pot on a little bit. And we may be hearing more from you on. And I love it because you're a thought leader and you ideation is definitely in your top five. Uh, you're, you're ahead of all of us. And the, the concept or the, the term that you're using is customering. 
Um, and could you define it for us and talk about the implications for how designing experiences could apply to marketers? So, so yeah, so my partner, Jim Gilmore, I just did a master class here in Minneapolis uh, last month on this topic. And the basic idea to understand is that um, uh, there are no markets, only customers. Right? Markets are a fiction we tell ourselves we don't know who our customers really are. But a customer isn't part of a market or a segment or a niche or a demographic or a persona, right? All of those are, 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 are uh, groupings of customers that do not exist. A customer is an individual living, breathing person. Or if you're selling to, to other companies, they're they're a uh, you know active uh, uh, corporeal individual uh, uh, entity, and so we need to ascend to the proposition that all customers are unique, unremittingly, undeniably, unarguably unique, and therefore we need to stop marketing and start customering. And so that's where the idea comes from: is how do we mm. customer? And and I, I will say, you know, the term marketing's only been around for like 120, 30 years, maybe. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, it didn't fall trippingly off the tongue when it was first uttered either. Uh, but uh, same with customering, but that's what we need to do. Um, and involves uh, you know, a whole lot of different things. You know, the, one of the fundamental principles of customering is to go from push to pull, right? To stop making stuff and pushing it out, putting it on shelves, putting it in inventory, and instead pulling from customers what their, their individual wants are and doing something different for them. So that then harkens back to the mass customization that because you want to do so efficiently, right? Mass customization is efficiently serving customers uniquely. So you want to do exactly what they want, give everybody what they want, but do it at a price they're willing to pay. And so you pull that information from them, you pull the, the, the uh, in-process inventory to produce a product for the customer. Again, think about the Coca-Cola freestyle machines. They come up, they tell you what they want, you pull that information from them, then and only then, do they pull literally, right? Pull down uh, the different elements, the the, uh, the fluids, right, to go into your particular drink, and uh, and deliver it to you. So uh, I and I think the the I mean many other things we can go to, and I won't go into a lot of all the details, but I'll relate it also back to the progression of economic value that it's important to do customering there because of um, um, if you if you think about it. Uh, Commodities, goods, and services exist outside of people. Experiences and transformations happen mm -hmm. inside of people, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's inside of us where we get engaged and we create that memory inside of us. And then we use those experiences to actually change. Then we're, we're changing from the inside out. So experiences and transformations are, are um, uh, inside of us. They're inherently individual, unlike the you know, good, uh, commodities, goods, and services. So part of customering is to go beyond those things outside of us and reach inside of people, engage them, and even transform them from the inside out. The, the mega trend, right, the one word I like to use that describes this whole uh, uh, progression of economic value is, in fact, individualization. It's about getting more and more individual with customers. You know, we, you know with customization being that route up, as we talked about earlier, Mark, that customizing yeah. turns good into a service, a service into experience, and an experience into a transformation, right? If you design an experience that's so appropriate for per person, you can't help but make it a life-transforming experience. And so that, that essence of individuality, plus the fact that you're reaching inside of people and engaging them. So, so customering is a route to really take advantage of this trend of individualization that, that, uh, that people really want. Mm, I love that. I, I love to uh, pull gems out when guests come up with something that they say kind of fast, and I just want to slow down and make sure <laughs> people have a chance to get that double double click on that one, which is, um, you know, we go from experience all the way to trans transformation, and that transformation comes back to an internal. Love the idea of these other things, good services, products, um, they're all external experiences or internal. I never thought about it that way. That's really cool. Right. Um, I, I have one other question that I want to ask before my closing question, which I, which I asked all guests, but it is something that came up as you mentioned that last topic. And that is, Joe, you, you um, have talked about things big and small in terms of the world of uh, customer experience, big being experience economy, progression of value. These are big concepts, yeah. big things, or you talk about, 
uh, economies and countries and companies, you know, but then we just talked about individuals and impacting people's lives. And we only have so much time, big and small. What's your why? What, what is your why for being in this profession? Well, it's actually, it's, it's what I talked about earlier. My why, my, my raison d'etre for, uh, in, for uh, working in business uh, is to figure out what's going on in the world of business first and then develop those frameworks to first describe what's happening and prescribe what, what companies can do about it. So that's, that's what I've done ever since I started on this path with uh, mass customization over 30 years ago. So but by understanding those patterns and, and figuring out those, those patterns so that you can help uh, shed light on where we should be going to make things better, what, what will come of that? What are the outcomes you, you would like to think would come out of that? Well, it, it, uh, to, 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 to state it humbly, I want to change the world. <laughs> <laughs> right hey. at least the world hey. of business and then but it also has a lot of effect on us as individual people yeah. uh, not just on our work and um i you know because fundamentally and i got this from my colleague kim corn who helped me write infinite possibility um and others it's about it's about human flourishing what business is about human flourishing it's not about making a buck right it's not about targeting people and trying to uh um um uh, get money out of their wallet, you know, so to speak. It's about human flourishing. How do we help them? And and transformations are the most uh, related to human flourishing because it's help. How do we help us be better people? How do we help us uh, uh, do things that we couldn't otherwise do? How do we help us, you know, self actualize, as Maslow would say, and become who we want to become? Uh, and businesses have that opportunity to do it. And I and so I'm a I'm an apologi apologist for businesses, right? That the mm -hmm. businesses have been the greatest force for good in the world, right? Particularly since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, all the statistics will tell you how much better off we are. And that's all because businesses created value for individual uh, people. Uh, and so, and I'm, so I'm help, trying to help them create greater value by understanding what it is that people really want and need and desire. All right. So... Trying to change the world. I love it. I love it. Okay, last question here. What advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, well, what occurs is, I don't have as, as much advice as a statement, but I tell my 20-year-old self, you won't be a nerd forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. Joe, thank you so much uh, for being on the Delighted Customers podcast if if um, our listeners would like to connect with you or get a hold of you, touch base, what would be the best way? Um, you can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. Uh, okay. Just look up Joe Pine. I'm on Twitter at Joe Pine. Or you go to our website, uh, www.strategichorizons.com. Uh, and if you do a Google search on my name, you'll find that quickly enough. Um, where we And we do have a contact page there, as well as an email that you can use. And uh, that uh, for our quarterly field notes newsletter, which we do, that, that gives articles out on the on the um, uh, on the experience economy uh, and uh, and other emails on our writings and events. Excellent, and that will will include that in the show notes as well. Super, Joe. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Mark. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the Delighted Customers Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode or any of my other ones, hit subscribe or follow. I've got a lot of other great guests that are coming up and a lot of other great content. I don't want you to miss anything. You can find any links or references on the show in the show notes, and you can find those at my website at empoweredcx.com. That's E-M-P-O-W-E-R-E-D-C-X.com. Also, make sure to check out the other shows in the Agile Brand Podcast Network by going to www.agilebrandguide.com. The Delighted Customers Podcast with Mark Slayton is produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content.
Fragile Brand. Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.